um, hi, so I'm the prof, I've got a hangover, a bad one, and I'm going to talk about a language called hi. So say hello to Cuddles the cattlefish, that's our language's official mascot, although she looks more like an octopus, so I kind of prefer this one, she's much more badass, but anyway, so hi <coughs> is essentially um, a Lisp dialect, a dialect of Emacs Lisp that runs on top of Python. Irresistible combination, but you would ask why? Um, well, the first part is that it's a Lisp dialect, which means that the syntactic sugar, by the way, I love that term, syntactic sugar. The syntactic sugar of Lisp comes on top of Python, which is actually quite interesting once you start going into, say, mathematical co computing, which is something I'm into. Plus the part that there's very, very easy interop between Pi and Python. As you know, Python happens to have a lot of languages for math and science. So, which list doesn't have? I mean, not a, lot, not a lot of other languages have that kind of ecosystem. So it's actually not a bad mix. It feels quite intuitive. Uh, but it also has its disadvantages, which I would like to just enumerate before we go any further. Uh, seeing that this is functional con, unfortunately, high is not that functional yet. So things like immutability uh, aren't, do, don't really exist beyond what Python provides. So if anybody's familiar with Python, um, tuples are an immutable data structure. Apart from that, everything else is uh, mutable. Everything else can change on the fly. Also, high does not have monads. There are unofficial implementations. Somebody's trying to port a closure the, clo the closure languages implementation onto high, but it's nowhere near complete. However, having said that, uh, doesn't mean that high is not useful. It's got a lot of things going for it, and I hope to enumerate them as we go along further. So yeah, uh, very easy to get started with high. Uh, you can just do a pip install. Pip is the Python languages for, uh, library management system, and high has a console. It has a repl. It also comes as an interpreter. And what Hi basically does under the hood is it compiles Hi code to Python abstract syntax trees, which the Python interpreter can then run. So you can also see the interpreter, the generated Python code. You can optimize that further. You can also see the abstract syntax tree. So if you ever want to hack on top of the language, it's a little like LLVM. You know what's going on under the hood, so you can you know implement things better. So yeah, as you can see, uh, list like list like syntax. So let's do a deep dive into it. Like you know, Pi uses postfix, uh, sorry, Lisp uses postfix notation. So let's uh, so I used to do it, and now I'm starting with Pi and Pi And we need to set the symbol, which also exists in Lisp, to assign a value to a variable. The value can be the result of a function, it can be a string, an integer, any kind of value. Uh, when it comes with, so all, all of Python will be functions like putting uh, string functions, dates, everything is function from inside high as well. Um, also, we've got notation just like this. So, this thing is going to be 60 seconds, sorry. So yeah, as I was saying, it comes with dot notation as well, which is something that Lisp is Lisp and other Lisp-like languages like Scheme and Closure are pretty famous for. Also, uh, you can uh, if you assign a string to another variable in high, then you can use all associated functions that come along with it, like checking out its length and so on and so forth. Uh, then we come to conditionals. So uh, the if loop is pretty basic, similar to what you would see in uh, Lisp. However, if, uh, if you guys know, so sometimes you want to switch between different conditions within an if loop. So usually you have else if or elif statements in different languages. Unfortunately, because of the nitty gritties of compiling that into an ASK, I doesn't support that. So what it otherwise does is give you a conditional statement, which is similar to switch case or select case loops. So you can usually end up using that and get better performance as well as evaluate multiple conditions at once. Uh, for loops are also pretty intuitive. Uh, then the best part, like I mentioned, Python interop. So the entire Python system library is available to you. Apart from that, anything, any other library that you install into your 
Python namespace, either globally or within a virtual environment, is also available to you. Easy marshalling of Python data types. And uh, yeah, that's part. It sounds very list comprehension. So, I, in fact, yeah, I'm supposed to run most of this code. Um, just a second. So, some some troll, God bless him, has come up with uh, a Jupyter kernel for I. So, you get just like similar to what you saw in the morning. Viral was showing off I Julia. This is I have. Which sounds terrible, but that's how we are. So yeah, uh, let's run some code. So what this part basically does is it prints out a chessboard. Doesn't look very pretty, but it's a chessboard. So the best part is that with list comprehension, you can quickly, uh, you know, amalgamate two different lists together and iterate through them, print them all out. Then comes one of my favorite parts: uh, threaded macros. So unlike list, uh, I does not have great support for macros, but the one thing that really shines is threaded macros. So as you can see, very classic example, read eval print loop. It's a it's a loop, right? That's it. But when you actually try and write it out in high or any other or any list like language, it comes out like this, which is usually never very readable. Uh, doesn't seem very intuitive. Except that when you use threaded macros within the arrow operator, you can make that way more readable. So in the same way, let's say uh, on most Unix-like systems, you have a user dictionary which consists of words that you might add, either in your native language or words that you know you don't want to be caught by spell checkers every time. So in Python, Python comes with a library called assets which allows me to hook into any bash command and pipe that into Python. And if I, if I do it you know, the usual way in high, it looks like this which frankly makes me want another hangover, but I don't want another hangover, so I go for a threaded macro and that makes it much more readable, much more concise and it allows me to actually be able to tell someone, okay, this is what I'm trying to do. Uh, let's talk about high is because it runs on top of Python, uh, you get object oriented programming as well, which is probably the wrong place to talk about it, but sometimes objects are useful. So very easy to define your own objects and then treat them as functions later on in your code. You can also hook into ORMs or ODMs like SQL Alchemy or Mongo Engine and then write entire data models in high and have all your data logic abstracted away in the form of high code. So yeah, let's do some demos. Um, SymPy, uh, which a lot of people have been mentioning today, comes with uh, a lot of cryptographic packages. Uh, my favorite happens to be the Viginet cipher because this, there's this really interesting story behind Queen Mary and how she got executed because she used that cipher which she thought was unbreakable. So yeah, let's start another notebook. We will just start up here. So essentially, uh, let me just quickly run through this particular statement. Uh, what the import statement remains the same across Python and Pi. But the way you import libraries is a little different and tricky to grasp at first. Now usually namespaces, module namespaces are represented with dot notation. When you want to Im import a specific function or a specific object from a library, then you enclose that within two square brackets. Otherwise, usually uh, the high comp uh, the high interpreter gets confused as to whether the module exists or not and throws an import error. So let's import the Viginer the Viginer encryption algorithm. That's essentially a function. And best part about iHi is that you know it's easy to jump between different lines, test your code, also graphics, very very nice. So I'll just define a key and because we are high and. So usually when you are uh, like this, uh, I does not really have uh, the equality or assignment operator. Usually a space is what is used to uh, denote assignment. And now all we do is
and that interface. So best part is that is like I, like I keep mentioning that I keep loving easy interact with Python. And the reason I keep emphasizing on that is because Pi as a language is for me as a mathematician uh, great for prototyping. If I have some algorithm in my head, game theory, anything that I want to prototype, Julia is a great language. In fact, I actually do love Julia a lot. But I might just want to prototype it real quick and then see if I'm even going anywhere with my idea. I see a workflow where Pi is the first step of actually prototyping a model in your head. And once you see it going somewhere, then you can take it further by importing it into another language, which could be any. Because it's Python, it has visits to so many other languages, you know, the world is at your fingertips, so to speak. Then, um, the best part I love about Pi is symbolic computing, SymPy. Now, if I just define symbols in uh, for uh, an algebraic expression here, the notebook is not going to render them using LaTeX properly. So I'll have to import pretty soon, right? And just follow. Now, uh, how SymPy works is basically it, 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 it works on the basis of symbols. Algebra, algebraic expressions have usually have variables x, y, z, sometimes mu. Uh, so in SymPy, you define them as symbols, and then you can create uh, uh, various algebraic expressions around them, and then you can do a lot of things. You can do calculus algebraic expansion and a lot of different different things. So that's X and Y right there. Now as you can see it's pretty printed because of the notebook. If you try the same thing in a console, probably not gonna work. And then I can create a whole expression from it. Now the funny part is that intuitively when you first look at it, it doesn't look very nice, post fix notation and whatnot. But when you actually start using symbolic computing with high you find you usually find that postfix notation is what makes more sense because it allows you to group uh, and prioritize your uh, mathematical operations in a more cleaner, more saner manner. So now if I so yeah, then I can do a lot of other things. I can add, subtract, I can expand it, factorize it. So yeah, uh, let's try some of that. Can do loads, and then I can even factor it. So, stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. The way you can easily, quickly get started with stuff. Uh, then, just for fun, uh, just to show you guys that it's possible. If you ever forget the speed of light, and if you ever need to remember it, or quickly figure out what the speed of light really is, then you can just use astrophy. So there we go. Uh, Postal is 2.81. I don't know why it's saying 2.99. Uh, I'm probably existing in a time loop right now, so that's my nice case. And uh, the best part about Pi. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, personally, what I feel about Pi is that it's a great language to prototype real quick. And sometimes you might want to make those prototypes publicly accessible, which is where you know. Uh, Python's web elegance come, comes into play because using Pi, you can quickly create basic web apps that can then export your functions and your models to and through. Uh, one very interesting scenario is there's this dashboard, there's this particular library called PyXlate, which uses a combination of Flask and the React framework to render better dashboards, better data driven dashboards. So you can use Pi to do a bit of statistical modeling to test 
a particular bias that you might have. Maybe you know you're doing some Bayesian analysis, and then you can use a combination of high and uh, reactive dark folds and quickly render a prototype that says, okay, that's someone's having fun. And then you can quickly figure out if your analysis is even going anywhere or not. So yeah, I think high has got a bit of a future as long as they figure out how to get you know, the functional aspect filled in. Uh, one, one fix that I discovered for immutability is just declare a variable as a, top, as a tuple when you're done with. It's a very ugly hack, but it works. Uh, so yeah, scale Hydra. And uh, a bit about me, I'm basically a mathematics and nanotech historian. And currently I work as a community evangelist at a place called Vindify, where I'm building a community for product enthusiasts across India. You know, just share great hardware and software products. But, but something like a cross between a product hunt and a hacker meet in India. And yeah, you can check out some of my code. Hopefully, I'll be able to put this up. And yeah, if you have any questions, which you know, you can just fire them right away. Because we still have a lot of time for questions. Uh, the there, uh, there isn't, unfortunately. You will have to write your high script in a different file and then import it. So, as of now, no. Great, I think that's done. Do you guys want to enjoy some Karnatic computer generating music? It's pretty good. That guy is doing some crazy stuff. Anyway, thank you ever so much. That was that.